Welcome to the IPX True North Podcast, where we connect people, processes, and tools. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the True North Podcast. Uh, My name is Brandi Taylor. I am the VP of Services for IPX, and we have a fun and passionate discussion lined up today with Lisa Levy. So good afternoon, Lisa. Hi, Brandi. Thank you so much for having me on the conversation today. Yeah, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate that you're spending some time with us today. So just as a quick introduction, I was just going to tell our listeners a little bit about you and then uh, let you kind of kick it off with uh, what you'd like to share. But Lisa is an author of a book titled Future Proofing Cubed, which you can find on Amazon. And she has also founded L Cubed Consulting, which is a management consulting firm that focuses on aligning her clients' people, processes, and technology, which is perfectly aligned with our CM2 methodology at IPX. So I'm really excited to, to dive into this with you today. And, and her secret sauce to success is leveraging key elements of project management, process performance management, internal controls, and organizational change management to build teams with the skills and capabilities to drive strategic results. So I know that's quite a bit of a mouthful, but I love every piece of that. So Lisa, I guess to kick us off on the right foot, I would love for you just to tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and why you started L-Cubed Consulting. Absolutely, Brandy. Thank you. This journey began for me in 2009. I was in my mid thirties and I had my dream job. I was building a project management office for an emerging company that was getting ready to IPO. And I had everything I thought I ever wanted. And I hated everything about every day. And I looked around this company and Every C-level executive had a team or a swarm of consultants surrounding them, and nobody was talking with each other. And I looked at that, and it made me physically feel ill to know, one, how much money we were spending, and two, to understand that absolutely nothing was getting done. I'd been hired in to build the project management office, which in this space was meant to be cross-functional was intended to bring everybody together to be effective and efficient so that we can drive results. Every day was a battle. And in the last six months that I worked there, I reported to seven different C-level executives until I finally, my head exploded. And I said, enough is enough. Crazy is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And on a whim, in a moment of passion, I created L-Cubed Consulting and decided that I was going to do something different in the consulting space so that all of these things that I had built, the skills, the tools, and everything over 15, almost 20 years of career could be leveraged effectively by businesses that really wanted to drive strategic results through their operational teams and their day-to-day tactics. I love it. So just that passion that you have and all of that, that contained emphasis, right? There's not much you could do. And it was that breaking point moment where I can help. I can do this. Like I want to see things get better and just have that moment where it's time to break away and just do your own thing. And I I love that. I love hearing that kind of a story from people because there's this always pivotal moment. That, that is just really important for people who decide to just step aside and think differently and do things differently. And so I guess I would like to you know, talk to you a little bit more you know, about some of our synergies. And I know, obviously, the first are obvious with people, processes, and technology, and with the large focus on leadership alignment. So I'd love to hear from your perspective and the work that you've done to date. Talk to me about some of the common pitfalls that you see with leaders trying to assess their own organizations through the lenses that we're talking about here with people, processes, and technology. So the first challenge in that question, right? Leaders doing it for themselves, they're inside of it. So it's a perspective issue. Can you see the forest for the trees? And I'm a really big believer that even the best leaders with the most capabilities who understand the value of aligning people process and enabling with technology still need a third party objective point of view to really see and understand what's going on. 
we all have our own individual biases. We have our own blind spots and we can be really effective and miss really critical things. And so when I start with a new team and the leadership, I actually do start with them and I ask and I, you know, we interview and talk through what they see about their organization, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and what they think the actual opportunities are. And then I put all of that information aside and then I go and I talk to the people. And without trying to compare or contrast point of views back and forth until I'm done and then put the picture together, right? What we see here at the strategic level and what's happening day in and day out are almost never aligned. And that then defines out what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. It makes a lot of sense to me to think about it from that light because you know, I think leaders have been down in the trenches and they feel that they understand that. But what they don't see is how much things change over time. And even in a couple of years, you know, the their vision of what you know they believe to be true down in the trenches is now just a perception. And so I love that you get down to the heart of it. You know what? We're going to talk down to the users, to the working level people, the people that are doing your processes and really find out what's really going on. And if you get that environment where they can speak freely, you can learn so much. Absolutely. Right. So as a leader, we make certain assumptions based on the way we may have done it 10 years ago, 15 years ago, even five years ago. If our perspective is absolutely spot on and we were absolutely correct. One of two things has happened. We have a really awesome company and we're doing all of the right things, which I almost never encountered. I know that they're out there, but if somebody's reaching out to me, they're not in that place or they're really stuck in old ways and old modes of doing things. And, you know, they're trapped and they're stuck. And that is, they're probably failing. And there are probably significant measurements that show that business is in jeopardy. And so you need the full rounded, you know, kind of that 360 degree point of view. And to get there, you know, we didn't talk about it yet, but some of that input is coming from customers as well, right? But that's kind of a next step. So once you've spoken down at the right level, identified problem statements, what are the next steps for you? How do you go back now and work with leadership to help open their eyes or refresh their views so they can see things from this new angle? So one of the things that I like to do once we have that information and sometimes hearing it is a little hard, right? Because they thought that they knew what was happening. And so I like to set it aside and start an ideation experience, right? What will the future look like? Where do we want to go? So we kind of know where we are. We know our as is. Then I want to understand the hopes, the dreams, the aspirations for the, the business, the division, wherever it is that we're playing. Again, so we can do a compare and contrast so that we can map out the steps to get from today to three months from now, six months from now, a year, whatever that roadmap looks like. And so it's really important for me to go through that ideation and understanding what the opportunities are, what the aspirations are, so that we can pick the things that we can influence. Some of it are going to be the low hanging fruit, the fast wins that we can do that make an immediate impact. Some of them are going to require some planning and some time. And so as we get to that stage, right, we want to build a roadmap with a blending of all of that. So that we're bringing on immediate impact and building the foundation for ongoing growth. Got it. And so when you're thinking about what that roadmap looks like, and I like the way you're thinking about that, as we understand the as is, we want to talk about where we're going to go. What's the to be? And what does the business look like then? And in a lot of times you hear the word disruptive and I want to get your take on this because so many times, you know, we hear, you know, where we got to go, we want to be disruptive. And so that's what the roadmap is all about. And I think a lot of times when people say the word disruptive, I, I'm not sure they're thinking about it holistically. So often they think about it really focused at cutting edge products or technology, but I feel that at times can be really short-sighted and disruptive can be internally as well. So 
talk to me about how you feel about the word disruptive and how does that fall into place here with defining their roadmap and their goals and objectives? So right, disruptive is one of my favorite words. I use it in my, you know, I am the disruption and innovation catalyst from a speaker's perspective and, you know, my public facing persona, which sounds so much better than just, you know, like I'm a process person. It's fun. Disruption is about the cutting edge technology. That's a piece of it. And all of those leading edge um, in, things that lead to innovation. But the disruption that I like to talk with and I like to play with is the idea of challenging the status quo. It is absolutely positively internal facing. And it is something that we have the ability as leaders to control and to throttle. And it doesn't mean that we have to be 100% disruptive all of the time. That is exhausting. But it does mean that we have to keep our ears open for those points where we're stuck. Why do we do what we do? Well, that's the way we've always done it. That's an opportunity to choose to be disruptive and to make a change and make a positive impact. And that's the type of disruption that I like to play with. It doesn't mean it's the big swing every time. Sometimes it's a collection of small disruptions that will allow us to change, allow the change to set, stick, and continue so that we don't backslide into the way we used to be. So what I hear you saying, and in other words, is maybe continual improvement. And people don't think about it in that light, right? Continual improvement sounds ugh, painful, drudging. You know, we're you know we're just gonna continually change. So talk to me. Like I, I love the way that that you stated that, and I think continual improvement needs a refresh, right? The term of that needs something different because I think that there's a lot of keys to exactly what you're talking about in that realm. And sometimes, right, it's the words that we play with and how we play with them, right? Continually improving does sound kind of boring, but continuously adapting might sound a little bit better because it's a, it feels a little more realistic because situations are changing and we have to adapt. Some people would use the word pivot and I just can't. That just chokes <laughs> in my throat funny. But ongoing continual improvement in many environments is going to be highly disruptive because they have their policies, their processes, and their procedures, and they're written down. And we pretend, as I'm using my little air quotes, we pretend to follow them every day and they are rigid and they do not allow for deviation. And we are measured in our Six Sigma world and this is all great. But the reality is there are things in those policies, processes, and procedures that need to adapt. There are people working in those organizations. I dare say that they are the lazy people working in those organizations who have the best insight to how to improve those policies, processes, and procedures because they're already working around them so that they can work smarter, not harder. And so initially for rigid companies, if they're going to adopt this mindset of continually improving, it's going to feel disruptive and it's going to hurt. And there is going to be a tremendous amount of resistance. But over time, as we adopt the mindset, the disruption goes away, the effectiveness, the efficiency come into play, and people are understanding how the processes work better than they ever have before, and they're making them easier. And then you have a whole new corporate culture. In order for this kind of transformation to take place, I feel that there's some very specific leadership traits uh, that really come along with making sure that you're able to cultivate that kind of activity and experience. So talk to me about what leadership traits that are you looking for or that you can learn, ob obtain to help be, you know, support disruption in that light. So there are, traits are an interesting thing. So some of them are things that we have naturally. Some of them may be more capabilities that we can actually learn and apply. A truly disruptive leader, right, on the far end, the extreme end of a disruptive leader, is an individual naturally that loves risk. They have no fear of it. They have no concern about it. The more risk involved, probably the more appealing whatever it is sounds to that individual. In the world, that's like less than 5% of the population. But they're out there. And they're important. And they're the ones who will do the big thing right? The big sweeping disruptions. 
most people aren't in that space, right? But we're somewhere on our risk tolerance scale, but we're willing to accept calculated risk. And we can, if we can understand it, we can work within it. That's a great trait, right? As a leader, we also need people who are humble and willing to say, I don't know what I don't know. And I want to learn and hear from everybody else because the team around me is what makes me successful as a leader, but it's what makes us successful as an organization. And so it's really about the leader who looks out the window and says, that is where all of the magic happens. I'm just, you know, I'm mixing metaphors. I'm on a roll today. I'm conducting the symphony. And that's a really wonderful leader to work with in this space because they will let everybody else step into their highest level of performance and move the group forward. And, you know, they have to be willing to do the actual change. Right? So we've already kind of got them on that scale of we're comfortable with calculated risk. And then they actually have to be willing to execute and do. And that's a perfect leader for this kind of undertaking. It's not particularly complicated. In order for that kind of a leader to be successful, you have to start to, like you said, you mentioned culture, and, and you have to start to create the right culture that brings that out in people. And so many organizations are afraid to voice, you know, they're complaining or, you know, they're, whatever that, there's some negative connotation that comes around with that. A lot of times we see these firefighters, these people that are just the get it done person, and they will work around process. They will work around anything to be successful or to make things happen. And that gets praised and encouraged and people are incentivized to work around the process and kind of make things happen that light. So that is a culture that is hard to change. So, you know, and we've all heard culture eats strategy for breakfast. So how do you coach leaders to begin to change the culture? Like, is it possible? And how do you create that culture that, that really sticks, that helps create that environment that's encouraging for disruption? One of the things that's so impactful in those initial conversations with leadership, with operational managers, with you know individual workers, right, and understanding what's going on in the company, is you really start to understand the perceived culture or the desired culture versus the reality of the culture. And everything that we do in tr- choosing to be disruptive, right, is to create alignment. From, the str- from strategy through operations to day in and day out tactics, right? Everything has to work together. So in that first sort of round, we know where there are some breaks in culture and we have the opportunity. You gave a great example, right? We have processes to do things one way and yet we have incentive plans which actually incent not following the process, right? So right there, we have a pain point that we need to understand and fix. I'm willing to wager a nickel that incentive came out of a crisis at some point in the past, was put in place and forgotten about. And we need to relook at, does the behavior need to align more with how we were incenting it? Do we need to go back to what's documented or C, we need to do something that's new and different because we've outgrown both of those other approaches. So in looking and understanding where the touch points are, understanding moments that matter in the process and in the value chain, we start to understand the things that really do drive culture. We'll also start to see where we have resistance to cultural changes from leaders, from managers, from employees, as we start to pull the levers on what's incented, what isn't, we start to see where the thresholds are. And then there there are decisions. How fast do we move through this process or do we slow it down to build adoption and comfort? And everything can be managed, right? The pace can always be controlled depending on what our desired outcomes are and how, you know, what impact we're trying to make and the why behind it for everybody. Thinking about the incentive that we're talking about here, and, and I'm you know, it's so easy to incentivize a firefighter because like you said, it's a crisis that is brought to everyone's attention immediately. And it's all hands on deck and, and, and all eyes are on you. We got visibility and all the good things and you're ready to make it happen. So in order to start incentivizing the proper ways of working, let's do it right the first time instead of have to go and deal with this fire. 
it's not as easy for leaders to have to proactively take that time to go and incentivize following the process and doing the right things and making sure we are doing continued improvement to help that we don't end up having these type of crises. And so it's not always very intuitive for leaders to do that. Is there a way to help encourage them to think about it from that light too? What's oh, really interesting in how you were staging that question, I think that the crisis, right, and the deviating from the norm and the end of that is an internal control that I would use in the process to say, this is a time for us to look at this process. So because we did that, because we had to incentivize behavior outside of the norm, when we kind of come back to steady state, that would be one of the first things that I would want to do is the lessons learned around why we made the change, why we did the incentive, and how do we need to modify things? Or was it truly an outlier? I mean, sometimes things just happen and it's a one-time shot and it's done and it's over and that's great. But when I, you know we talk about the things that I like to layer in, that's a place for that control step that says, time out, why did we do this? One of my clients during the pandemic in the healthcare space, early on in the lockdown, we built wonderful processes. We had wonderful controls around the entire procurement to payment processes and how they obtain their supplies. And the CFO of the organization was inundated with people breaking the process. And she felt like she had built this wonderful thing that served everybody so incredibly well. And now everybody was sneaking around behind her back to try and do something different. I was talking with her and I said, why do you think that they're doing this? And you know, it was a big, they're trying to buy PPE any way they can get it by any method possible, but none of it follows any of our processes. And I laughed just a little bit because she was so distraught by this. And I said, come on. This is exactly why we're empowered to break our process. Empower everybody to get what they need when they need it, because they need it. And let the board know that we've got a moratorium on the approval process because this is legitimately a healthcare crisis. And she started laughing and she said, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I was so stuck in the way we've always done it that I forgot to challenge why we do it. And so those moments are, I think, the best ones for us to find those opportunities to improve. After the fact, they went back through the process, streamlined it, and got rid of several layers of approval that were no longer necessary. So working around the process became a best practice, and then it became part of the process. Absolutely. Right? I like those lazy people. Work smart, not hard. They often have really great ideas at how to fix the process. Yep. So, and, you know, people are just key. They make or break initiatives, right? You know, they're going to find a way to work around things if they want to, right? There is no foolproof process. And I think a lot of times you'd mentioned briefly earlier, and I want to get your take more on this, is organizational change management. It's something that a lot of times with big scale initiatives, people find this as a nice to have. And it's often the make or break for me, for the transformation activities that we work with at IPX is you have to be able to communicate. It's not, you know, everyone feels at organizations, you know what, it's their job. They're going to do, we're going to tell them what to do and they're going to do it. And this is just, it is what it is. There's some level of agree. You got to have the top down push in the support, but the organizational change management piece is critical. It's something that really could be its own project in itself with its own resources, its own timeline, its own funding. It's not, it's, so that's where it's seen as a nice to have. But doing OCM well is absolutely critical to making sure that the changes are adopted and they stick. And I want to get your take on how do you help leaders see OCM in that way and not say, well, you know what, they're just got to do what they got to do because it really is a critical activity. When you were introducing me, you talked a little bit about my secret sauce of project management, process performance management, internal controls, and organizational change management. I stacked them in that order and I saved the best for last. Organizational change management in my mindset is the critical to success undertaking. 
the technology, if we're doing a technology implementation, the best technology doing everything it was designed to do and implementation will fail if we haven't gone through the organizational change process. It's that simple. So it is not a nice to have, and it is something that mindset is slowly changing, but it's very slowly changing. And it baffles me because there's so much data that supports how impactful it is. So from me and my perspective, it is critical to the success of any undertaking in an organization, big or small, because everything begins with our people process, then technology, everything begins with our people. And so the organizational change process is not about sending email communications, right? A project manager on an implementation team will have a communication plan that says when we're going to send those little emails out. That's only a very small part about it. It really is about building the adoption across the entire employee base so that they understand what we're changing, why we're changing it, and what's in it for them. And when we have them with the with them, what's in it for them, for me as an individual, that is the only time when I'm going to be willing to then engage and support you in whatever this changes that you want to make. And if you don't get me to that place, I can become an active resistor and I can make everything very difficult. On the flip side, if I'm one of those natural naysayers who questions and challenges everything, when I get to a what's in it for me, I leapfrog to the head of the class and I become the greatest, loudest voice to champion the change and become a change agent. So understanding how our people interact and how they respond to change is absolutely critical. And it needs to start early and it needs to be the messaging and the reasons behind everything need to be reinforced. When things fail to go according to a project schedule, we need to be honest and transparent about what that means. And sometimes that means we're going to work some longer, harder hours to try and recover that schedule. And that requires another what's in it for me moment. But if we keep our focus on our people and what that means, and we connect that focus to then what the change means to our customers, we will build groups and teams of people who are willing to move mountains to make that change happen because they get it and it impacts them and it impacts what they care about. I couldn't agree more. And I think it's so much about just making sure they're engaged and understand. And it's not even simply just about you know, where are we going and why, it also includes the repercussions for not changing. What happens if we don't change? What does that mean for us? What does that mean as a company or for our resources, et cetera? And so many organizations spend a lot of time on continued improvement of their processes, uh, of their tools. What about your people, right? Are you forgetting them and feeding them? and making sure that you're taking care of them. So they're the ones, they're the ones with the knowledge base, the tribal knowledge, the history, they're the ones that make it work. And that's the one that often seems of the three to fall to the wayside. And so I just wanna make sure that leaders remember that, you know, and if a leader doesn't appreciate their people and they think their people are easily replaceable, I think that's a big mistake. Cause I think investing in your people, just like you do your product and you do your processes, and your tools, I think is the most important piece. With the, the point that you made about what happens if we don't change, right? I get all hyped up and like talking about the fun, right? The enthusiastic, optimistic, the what happens if we don't change, right? Those are the hard changes. And oftentimes they're because things aren't going well. And if we don't change, let's be honest, bad things may happen. It is even more important to be very transparent and to be very overt about why we're doing those types of changes and eliciting input from around the company, around all of the teams and all of the perspectives, because that larger voice will help us come up with solutions that we as leaders may never have thought of that will positively benefit the company and the people. And so that time when we have this weird instinct as leaders to hold back, is really the time we need to open up the most. Agreed. And those naysayers, you know, the ones that are the people that you kind of roll your eyes at, they're the ones that, you know, have 18 reasons why they don't want to do it or we shouldn't do it or whatever. 
those can become your best friend. Because if you pull them in, they're going to give you that laundry list of, of reasons. And if you can address every single one of those and remove those, then the organization, often they're leaning on that person to, to do exactly that. So if you can satisfy their needs, then you're really in a good place to help satisfy everyone else's needs as well. Well, they've identified all of the risks, right? They're the ones who are saying, this is going to go wrong. This is going to go wrong. This will happen. And if you can address all of those, your path to success is a lot faster and easier. Yep, absolutely. Those road bumps won't happen. Agreed. You know, and we've already talked about how, you know, at, at IPX, we're process people and we do believe, you know, a lot of times clear and concise business processes really need to drive how the business operates day to day, that consistency across, and that then drives your tools and technology that are implemented to automate your processes. So, you know, I think process is something that I think people struggle with. And I would love to hear how you integrate attitudes and advisement around processes as well with your leadership and how does that all fit in? One of the things, and sometimes in these conversations, I'm a smidge flippant just because it makes a point faster, right? And the work is never as easy as it may sound when it comes out of my mouth in this conversation. This work is hard and it's important and it's, it, there is labor intensiveness behind it, but the rewards coming out of it are so important. Lots of companies say, oh, our processes are great. Everybody knows what they're doing. Everybody knows how to do it. And I ask, you know, for the proof, show me. And clients will bring out stacks of paper, send me attachments, Visio flowcharts, all sorts of things. And they're really good things. And then I say, okay, let's go see it in the field. Right. And so just using an example of, you know, I don't know, a call center. I want to sit with five different agents. I want to see what happens. And so I have the process in front of me. I may even have the procedures behind the process for that lower level of detail. And I watch and I listen. And some people do some of the things and some people do some of the other things. And the system flows them through maybe 80% of everything but there's still a tremendous amount of variation. And so then to the leaders, my question is, how can anybody go on vacation and not totally panic that everything's gonna fall apart because for processes to be real, they need to actually be repeatable. And they look at me like I'm crazy, but then they think about kind of in each department, there's that one person or those two people that if they aren't there, nothing works quite right. And then they start to think about, oh, if everything that was in those two people's heads was documented on the processes and the procedures, and everybody was trained well enough to follow the processes and procedures and knew that if it wasn't working, that they were empowered to say, hey, this sucks, let's try something different, they would be more effective and more efficient in everything that they do. There's an aha moment that happens. And I love watching that little lights in their eyes flicker on and they go, oh my God, actually investing into understanding and knowing our processes and training to it makes us better. It's fun. It is fun. It's my world. And so I, I love speaking with people who get this because it's something where there is so much variation in process. And if you, you know, so many organizations we meet with are really running on tribal knowledge and it's those good people that are holding all the walls up and they're successful because of that. And so we must have great processes because things are going well and we must have good procedures because everyone's doing things the same way and we're getting the same result. Are you sure? You know, I think getting, making sure that you have that tribal knowledge, getting that out and into your business best practices is key because then those people are not the ones who have to hold the walls up. They can be freed up to do more value added activities and they're able to delegate and translate that knowledge to more younger people or new people in the organization. And so then those people become much more valuable. Right. So they're able to then decentralize their knowledge and plant it in everybody who should have had it all, all along anyway. And they can elevate themselves into making impacts into new things, into continually improving into developing something net new because they've been doing this for so long, they have a bazillion ideas in their head and no time to share those. 
So I guess, you know, I can own, right? We're geeking out on the fun of what process <laughs> actually is. And most people would be like rolling their eyes going, I cannot believe you two like this so much. We're sick puppies. We've, so we've seen the impact. Yes. Yes, we have. It's really important. And I think just, you know, people don't understand the documented process, right? I think that they, they go off the, like I said, tribal knowledge, or they're just trained by osmosis, or they have organizations have what we call, excuse my language, document diarrhea, where there is just a huge amount of documents, but they're not organized in a way you don't know what you need to use when or where. And so again, you know, that's also a different problem that we often see. So it's important to really focus and make sure you are driving your business clearly and concisely. Absolutely. One example, I was working with a team and the process had a choke point. If the 3 p.m. report didn't make it into a repository, everything stopped. And I said, what's the 3 p.m. report? It sounds really important. And this woman looked at me and she said, I have no idea what it was, but every day at 3 p.m. I now put a Word document in that repository that's blank. And then nobody's yelling or screaming about anything. If it doesn't go into that repository, whatever happens after that stops. Nobody knew what the 3 p.m. report was supposed to be. They had just been putting the blank document in the repository for years. And I know that sounds unbelievable and ridiculous, but things like that happen everywhere all of the time. I just do it because it needs to happen. Have you questioned why? Have you thought about a better way to do it? You know, know, some people are just, "I, I just do what I'm told. Well, this woman really wanted to not have to do that, but it was so embedded that there was nobody who could understand why. So it was easier in that scenario for her personally just to do it so that everybody else could keep on keeping on until we really stopped and looked end to end and figured out that we have no idea why it ever existed and redesigned the process to not require it anymore. Yeah. Encouraging that open voice, right, is making sure that the coming back to the culture is leaders driving that culture to speak up, talk about improvements, making sure it's okay to talk about your pain points and bring those out in the open so we can fix things. Absolutely, right. Everything needs to be overt. We need to be able to say, you know, this doesn't work, or I don't understand why it should. And that is the key. And that's the starting point for that ongoing continual improvement is being able to ask and challenge and try to design better for the future. And be incentivized to do that. So Lisa, you know, you're doing so much great work with your business and, you know, with globally known companies, are there any specific areas of expertise that you have where you're actively out there searching to support for any of our listeners that you know, might just be interested in working with you or what you might bring? I am really focused right now on wanting to help founders who had great ideas for products or services. They've grown their company, they are delivering, but they don't know anything about running a business, right? They're visionaries and they're built a team around them, but they still feel very stuck in the day-to-day operations of because their baby is growing up and they're in it but they don't know what they're doing. And I want to work with those founders to set up that leadership team to be self-reliant, to have the operational teams executing flawlessly tactical resources, knowing exactly day-to-day what they're doing and how that aligns back up to the strategy so that founders can be in the founder space and have the freedom to come up with the vision for the new products, the new services. In many cases for them, it might be an entirely new business. And so that's the, the audience that I'm looking to support and help because they get stuck in things that they don't have the competency and the expertise to do. And they feel obligated to continue to try. And there's absolutely no reason that they should flounder and suffer like that. All right. Excellent. So Lisa, if anyone who's listening would love to speak to you directly to learn more about your work, your experience, everything that you do, do you have a preferred method of contact or how can they reach you? The fastest way to find me is on LinkedIn, and it's Lisa L. Levy, L-E-V-Y. The website for the company is L-Cubed Consulting, 
and you can find L cubed consulting as a channel on YouTube. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. It's been really fun speaking with you and uh, I hope we cross paths again. Thank you so much for inviting me to the conversation. Thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe and review the show. And for more information on IPX, visit IPXHQ.com.